in thinking about teaching a lot, um, especially making this series about John Swallow, it occurs to me that the teacher represents an aspect of the future for the student. The student's in a process of building and developing, and the teacher has more accomplishment. And so, so many things a teacher can say is to foster a future for the instrumentalist musician, in this case, that will have some longevity, hopefully. Now, John used to say things to me like, well, look, when you're warming up, or when you're on tour, you know, do some of the beach studies. Do some of the Simone Mantilla studies. Stuff to keep you firm. Obviously, that worked for him. So you can have some firmness in the embouchure, some mental flexibility. And... Um, I found how to do that in my own way. Um, and so, when I think about it now, I realize that certain kinds of those things were said from where he is, he was then, or from his experience, and that during the course, when a person's I've been teaching for over, for almost 45 years now myself. What I'm saying to a what I was saying to a student when I was 12 years old is different than what I'm saying to him at you know going to be 58 in January. So it's different. And there are threads that are probably always the same. But there are things that happen over time where you make the adjustments in your own playing and then pass those down to people. And so sometimes you have to rise to the level of experience in life where the teacher was coming from and for you to go, oh, that's what they meant. And so one of these situations I find very interesting as John talked about the embouchure, you know, he, he liked, you know, this idea of things being firm and in here and maybe putting a little more pressure here, having the jaw come out, of course, depending on the person. And he said, you know, my lip is so good, I can wreck it in 10 minutes. And that thought was really interesting to me. His lip is so good, he can wreck it in about 10 minutes. And I know what he means now. At the time, I thought, does that mean it's not set up for endurance, but it's just set up for a certain kind of finesse? And then I realized that depending on how you can tune it for something specifically, you do the wrong thing for that particular form formation, and you can stretch the formation. You can stretch or create an imbalance in that particular formation that can wreck <laughs> those particular chops. I could probably wreck my chops in thirty seconds <laughs> if I really wanted to. Let's not warm up for a couple days and just start playing high for two minutes loud. That might not feel good. And so, the refinement, though, in which he was coming from when he was saying it was very interesting to me. And if you think about little things that catch you that your teacher has said to you or anyone you're studying with or you hear certain things, if there's a little bit that catches you, thinking about it can help open up the territory because one of these things, if a person, someone like John, who is in such a process all the time, that little different coming together is going to be 
constant for that person. And that's like a tree, you know, just having fruit and then dropping seeds. And if the student is really interested and open, they'll take those things. It just won't be a dogma. John didn't teach him dogmas. In fact, none of my teachers really did. And so, and my parents didn't teach or didn't raise me in a dogmatic way. So what is the influence of a person? This is very interesting. And everyone's life takes different routes, routes, depending on what part of the country you're from. And his particular life, I think about it, you know, having so much time in New York City and the intense heat of that situation and the competitive aspect of that kind of life, I'm sure shaped him in a certain kind of way, with a certain kind of speed, a certain kind of swiftness of mind, a certain cleverness and perception to know what you're dealing with. He had a certain kind of job etiquette he would tell me about, you know. He would say, you know, don't go to any job and just start playing, you know, all your excerpts and all the things you can do great, you know, your first time going there, or maybe not too much at all, because it can tick some people off. And um, <laughs> I can see that even more from where maybe the kind of life he led. You have a regular orchestra job, I think that lets up a little bit. But I can tell you from my own experience on in the orchestra world that... Um, I wouldn't really think of ever playing someone else's solo that they're doing that week. And I've had people do that to me. Not just, you know, not necessarily on trombone, but even on other instruments, start, you know, other brass instruments, just kind of, that can be kind of annoying. And I think in a situation that maybe isn't so tenured, as freelancing all the time, you might want to be careful with that. He wasn't preaching anything coming from, I didn't feel paranoia, but just kind of common courtesy towards someone else. Playing their licks, if they're coming up, I think can be very annoying. So he helped someone with certain kinds of professional etiquette and many things, because for him it was a whole thing. And, uh, and near the conservatory, there used to be a McDonald's, you know. And every once in a while, a few of us would, um, or the person who had the lesson during the lunchtime, or a couple of us would go to McDonald's and just sit and talk and have burger and fries. And he was having burger and fries with everyone. And <laughs> it was just kind of a, he didn't create a mystique about him as being a separate teacher, this thing that would loom over you, that you would, you know, feel so nervous about in lessons. He said, I think Neil DiBiase was a little more like that for him. And he said he made a lot of progress with him. But he himself could not teach that way. And I never really had teachers that way. And I think if you're really disciplined, you don't need a teacher who does that. My personal view. Um, so, even though one time, um, after I was out of the orchestra, I I wanted to show him, you know. I used to play the Max Dead Studies in high school, and I had a very good high range and could play them very well. <clears throat> and so I wanted to show John how, you know, I was working on this stuff and playing them lighter and so it was after I um, left school, before I got into the orchestra, actually, probably 1974. When I came in, I was all ready to play a Max Dead form, and I played it. And uh, I was really ticked at the way that I played it. I didn't like it at all. And he said, good job, very good. And he wasn't over complimentary, though, but he wasn't like, you know, scholarly. 
And I'll never forget. When I said, mm, I don't know, I didn't like it. That wasn't very good. Oh, man. Did he get ticked at me. He really got ticked. And laid into me for a long time. I felt really bad. <laughs> and then he started to warm it up and say, you know, hey, let's go out and get a little something. And, and um, I don't know if I said this in another video, but it came up again because you had to push him before he would get pretty punchy. And, I mean, that was disrespectful of me. Hearing the teacher saying, you know, that was good job. It's not an easy thing to play going up to high F-sharp. And uh, I disagreed and was all like this, and I actually added another thing. I said, oh, I heard Glenn Dodson can play seven of these in a row without missing a note. That didn't help. 